Um, I am Jim Halterman. I'm the West Coast Bureau Chief for TV Guide Magazine. So welcome, everybody. What did you all think of the show? <laughs> Excellent. If you didn't know, Berlin Station is Epic's first step into scripted drama. Uh, premieres October 16th at 9 p.m. And right now you can watch this first episode. If you want to watch it again or tell your friends, it's up for free on the Epic's website, epics.com. So check it out. Um, and then episodes will start rolling out on the 16th. So uh, let's bring out the cast and talk about this show, okay? First of all, he plays Daniel Miller in the this, in this series, Richard Armitage. And she plays Valerie Edwards, Michelle Forbes. <laughs> and playing Robert Kirsch is Leland Orser. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So before we got we get started, I talked to Richard Jenkins today, who couldn't be here, but I did an interview with him, and I asked him, I said, do you want me to s say to anything to these wonderful people? And he just said that you, are, you all have to say his name at least once during the panel. That's what he wants. That's, That's he a very wants. Jenkins response. I love <laughs> That's it. That's what he said. Um, well, Richard Jenkins is currently working with Guillermo del Toro, who's clearly in a better place than we are. <laughs> Um, but let's talk about Berlin Station a little bit. Um, I know when I see anything called a spy drama, you kind of have an idea of what you might be getting, whether it's Jason Bourne or Bond, all those different spy things. Tell me what your, each of your perceptions were as you were just getting started with the project, maybe before you even shot, but just reading the script, what you thought it might be and what you found out when you actually found it, you know, what it was. Um, I've worked in spy genre before about, uh, maybe it was seven years ago, I did a show called Spooks in the UK. It was called MI5 here in the US. Um, so I expected to be rolling out of cars and pulling guns out and working with loads of gadgetry. And, and I think the, the, the more juvenile version of myself was really into that at the time. And uh, coming to this um, particular show, it, it was a surprise and a, uh, you know, a pleasure to see that actually the gadgets that we work with, uh, is, it's the brain and the heart and, and seeing how these characters Get, un, uh, get under the skin of their opponent um, and get into the minds and the hearts of who, who it is they're dealing with, not just a potential enemy, but a potential ally and, and their friends. That, uh, and I think it's, it's one of the reasons why um, you really feel like you can't trust anybody uh, in this show. And, and to me, that was, it was such a pleasure to play. You know, that's one of the things that I loved. Okay. Michelle, how about you when you heard spy drama? Um, well, I guess I'd done 24. Um, and I, I knew it was different than that. Um, but it was funny, because Brad Winters, our showrunner, I said to him a few months ago, I said, you know, I really hope we get a chance to, to see the show, because I still don't really know what the tone is. Um, even though we spent seven or six intensive months, uh, I, I, I didn't have, and I usually can see, I have an understanding of what we're trying to reach for. So I was, I was really happily surprised at how thoughtful and, um, and also how sexy and slick it is. And it, it really, it, 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 and it's pulling up that essence of Berlin, too. And I think doing a spy show in Berlin uh, makes this rather different, too. So I didn't quite know what to expect overall. God, that was a really long, convoluted <laughs> answer. I'm so sorry. I just bored myself. I think we are, we are with you the whole way. Lena, what was your perception? No, I think you it? nailed it. I mean, we didn't know. No, you did. You nailed it. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing, you know? Like for weeks, and then which turned into months, we were turning to each other and asking, what is it that we're doing here? What is the tone? And we sought that tone for for 10 episodes, and I, honestly, I think what the show is will define itself in the beginning of season two. Honestly, I think it is, f it, 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 like we, is uh, it, it searching for itself and, and, and finding uh, a place for itself to land. The turmoil and the tension and the conflict of the first season was very much uh, part of our, 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 our lives as actors, you know? 
And, and reading the script for the first time was so exciting. I mean, you, you got the, the, the sense that you were dealing with a contemporary uh, John le Carré uh, workplace human uh, uh, story about uh, people in, in the intelligence world. And, and to be a part of that was like, the, the prospect of that was incredible. Well, not really knowing exactly what the tone was going in, was that a challenge or was it actually kind of freeing that you weren't limited in a way by knowing what it was? It was both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the one, the one thing I struggled with a little bit was very early on as the scripts were coming in and you were seeking that tone or seeking your character's line and seeking the narrative that I would be awake at three in the morning trying to figure it out. And of course, the actor in me was like, you have to go to sleep because they're going to put an HD camera on you in the morning. <laughs> But then eventually, uh, and stop emailing the, 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 the writer at four in the morning because he's really not going to appreciate it. They were answering the email at four in the morning. But also, I sort of ended up yielding to that and thinking, you know what, this is probably what these, the lives of these people is, are like. I doubt very much whether Daniel Miller goes to bed at 11 o'clock and sleeps for nine hours. I think, he, I think these people go through that kind of constant analysis and constant turmoil so I just I just let it happen and, and I thought if I if I go on camera looking like The Walking Dead then fair enough and uh, that's a different uh, th show that's how it is <laughs> <laughs> you know with something like this you want to ask about research a little bit do you do each of you kind of just trust the script or do you dive into whether it's other things in the genre or well, books? We, we were all introduced to Robert Baer, who's a fantastic guy, has written a great book, and uh, we, I think we all did our own individual uh, online uh, research, and, and we were introduced to, to, to people in this, in, who had been in the CIA, who were currently in the CIA. But once, once you've done your, your homework, I mean, you, 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 really have to, you really have to just let it fly. I mean, you gotta, you gotta inhabit the, the, the personality of, of, of the person you're playing, and, let the let the research go. What what about your character's moral compass? Do they have moral compasses? Could, do you not because of the work that you're in? I mean, do we see or do we see that as a part of the show? Um, for for Valerie, um, it what, what I love what I love so much about her is that in a in a in a profession that lacks humanity. Uh, she really strives to maintain her humanity and her compassion and her her moral compass. Uh, and it's very easy to lose that when, when you're when you're struggling with so many identities and you're so you're always on the verge of losing your authentic self. Of course your moral compass is the, is the first thing to go. And um, and you know it's a very complex shell game that they're all playing. So um, but I don't know that that's so important to a lot of people, and that's something that sort of Brad and I talked about with Valerie that I wanted to infuse. But the people at the CIA, I, yeah, they're, a lot of them are morally bankrupt, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Leland, how is it with, with Robert? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's sad. Uh, what your, your choices are difficult and sad because y your emotional compass is, 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 is not the same as mine. I'm, my, my character is much more pragmatic, which is the job has to be done. I'm here to do the job. I'm here to make choices that are going to save more lives than perhaps less lives. And um, the, the moral compass is constantly fluctuating. The line goes up, the line goes down. And there are, when, when, times, when situations are, are difficult and challenging, uh, there are sacrifices that have to be made. And, and these, you know, they, they've had many, many years of training. And, and my character, I think, has come up through the, arms, uh, you know, through the armed forces. And uh, I, 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 our, our, our compasses are different. But at the end of the day, we have to do our job. Yeah, and, 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 and we respect, because we were talking about uh, Valerie and Frost earlier, uh, but also Robert and Valerie, with all the friction they have, there's still a, a, an overall respect. Even when they disagree, there's, there's an overall respect for the work ethic and for the years put in. Well, they, ha they, they rely on each other. Mm. Yeah. Richard, how about with Daniel? And, we, and do we see it take a toll on him? Because he seems very together at the start of the series, will we see this life kind of take a toll on him personally? Yeah, we do. We will, we will track that through, through the 10 episodes and we, we'll see him kind of follow Hector de Jean down a wormhole. Um, but actually in terms of um, losing yourself a little bit and, and monitor, monitoring your own moral compass, I was asked recently whether 
um, spies are good actors and whether, whether I, as an actor I would make a good spy. And it really made me think about that process of, you know, when a spy has to take on a, a I think they call it a legend, that, that it's not just being able to wear a funny wig and do a funny voice and get away with it. It's like, it's life and death. And I think um, I've realized this with Daniel, that he spends so much time projecting himself into the mind of an opponent and, and sort of empathically reaching into their, into their soul that he didn't spend an awful lot of time pondering himself. He was obsessing about the other person. Like the, you know, they, they don't call them analysts for nothing and they, they work in the field with assets and they, are, they become obsessed with them they, to the point where they are falling in love with them and they're stepping over a line which is in dramatic terms for me, that I've, I've found that the most fascinating aspect of, of playing this you know, genre. Well, yeah, my character has a line. I don't know if it's still it's still in or not. Where he says, y "You fuck, you get fucked." <laughs> That's a line you don't want to cross. That's charming. <laughs> <laughs> or two for the price of one. However, you wouldn't look. Endless cycle. Um, Michelle, talk about working with Richard Jenkins. I said his name, so I'm good. Um, but I, I love. Um, there's another another episode after this one where there's there's some good scenes between the two of you because he's kind of reprimanding Valerie, which is fun to see Richard Jenkins just kind of get. The, I call it the dad voice, just kind of. <laughs> but talk about working with him and and just the dynamic between Valerie and Frost. Um, uh, Frost is my superior, obviously, he's the head of the station, um, and Valerie, again, as with Robert Kirsch, respects him deeply, um, doesn't always agree with him, doesn't always agree with his methods, and does see him as the old guard boys club that is dying out. And, um, and she doesn't feel that his head is in the game, and, um, and she's right about that to a certain degree. So um, their methods are different, um, but she gets the job done too. Uh, <laughs> even, <laughs> even maintaining or attempting to, re uh, to maintain her humanity. Um, but I, I, I rather like the friction between Frost and Valerie as well, and, and that is also constantly shifting. What, is, what, what, what I love about the show is that all the relationships are constantly shifting. There are, there are all these tectonic platelet shifts for all of them, dynamics change, loyalties change. So there's a lot of sort of psychological gymnastics going on. And who plays Frost? That would be Richard Jenkins. <laughs> I'm gonna that make this That would happen. be one of the greatest actors of our generation, Richard Jenkins. I mean, you got two. We're good. I know we're good. Say it with me, kids. <laughs> Richard <laughs> Jenkins. <laughs> awesome. Um, Leland, talk to me a little bit more about Hirsch. I, I asked you backstage if, if his bark is worse than his bite, and you, you actually talked pretty eloquently about just the psychology of this guy. Maybe I only have it in me to do it once, you know. Um, uh, you know, uh, Robert Kirsch, who I play, is very pragmatic. He, he, is, he, has, he has no filter. He says what is on his mind, and that's a kind of wonderful thing to play. It's very freeing. It's just, it comes up and it comes out, and uh, and 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 it and it's wildly inappropriate in many situations. It's kind of rubbed off on me. And, well, <laughs> um, but that being said, he is. Um, he is the ultimate CIA man. He is a company man, and he cares passionately about his job and about doing everything he can every minute of every day to, to do the job well. That being said, his personal life is a f shambles, and, uh, and he can't hold it together. So underneath this, this, this tough exterior is... is a, is it is like a is a is a, is a uh, burning house? You know, he's lost his family, and uh, and 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 that I, I th that eats away at everything that he does. Do, do he and Valerie actually get along? I was trying to figure that out watching these episodes because you they, have they to watch quite them a bit. Ten, all ten. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, they have a they have a they have a they have a history. They have a special, okay. a special relationship. <laughs> With, with all of you, it, you know, because these are spies and there are lies and that we constantly see that in the show, is there trust with anybody? Can you trust anybody? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. 
Well, sure. As long as you know, you know, as long as you've done your research on them and your intel on them and you're watching them and listening to them, you can trust them as long sure. as you know what it is that they're doing. <laughs> I think there's, there's levels of trust, you know? <laughs> Does that make any sense? See, he really has rubbed up on you. <laughs> Richard, Verify, then trust. Richard Daniel's the character that kind of comes into this world. We kind of follow him into it. You know, what's his relationship with the CIA and with Berlin and what he brings to the station? Yeah, well, talking of trust, um, these guys think that I've been behind a desk for 10 years in, at Langley, and I haven't. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> where, so, so there you go. That's the file. Well, that's what's in the file. Um, yeah, he has a history. That, I mean, that was two threads of research that I was really interested in. He grew up in West Berlin. His father was in military intelligence, and he lost his mother in a kind of murky affair. She was having an affair with an East German officer, and they put a bomb in her car. It sort of becomes uh, an open wound that Esther Krug can poke and, and fiddle around with in, in, throughout the series. Um, so I, I went to... Uh, yeah, she gets her fingers in there. I went to... Um, I went to... What do they call it, Leland? Prostate. <laughs> it's a joke. I'm sorry. I've got photographs of it. No. Um, so I went Jim, to... Jim, I apologize. I'm so sorry. <laughs> there, was, um, there was a brilliant exhibition on in West Berlin just prior to filming. So I went and gathered loads of images of what life might have been like there. And then um, his kind of experiences in, in uh, America were very kind of regular. He went through the right universities. He's a patriot. He, you know, followed his father into the family business and, and worked for the CIA. And, um, uh, he, you know, he, he goes back to his, to his childhood full of its flaws in the cradle of the CIA, which is kind of fractured. And he's pursuing Thomas Shaw, who is ultimately going to blow the whole thing apart and, and really test his own patriotism. So to me, that was the sort of balance of the character. Who, who is Thomas Shaw? Wow. That's the question. I know, I know. Could it be somebody on I this panel? I, I don't know. I think it is. <laughs> we'll have to watch and find out. We'll okay. All right. Epics, October 16th. Um, ta ta With Richard Jenkins in it. <laughs> so. There you go. Okay. We're almost there. Um, How many times have you said it now? Okay. No, no, I haven't, and I'm not going to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the show is called Berlin Station, and thankfully this was not shot in Hollywood on a soundstage. This is in Berlin. Talk about each of your experience. Was, had you spent time there? We'll start with you, Richard. But had you spent time there before, and how did that change filming the show? I'd been to Berlin for one weekend for the, the premiere of one of the Hobbit movies and really didn't see the city at all. But it, to me, it's the sort of living, breathing, pulsating extra character that the show, the show is. I mean, it, it contains so much rich history, um, Prussian history, Weimar Republic, First World War, Second World War, the 60s, the Stasi, now there's this whole kind of futuristic architecture which the, the location um, managers found so many incredible places to shoot. And I really feel like it, it, it informs so much of the narrative as to, to these great places that we were able to go to. Aside from that, the people that we were working with, the creatives, the creative team, the line producers, um, the, the DOP, the costume designers, there's an edge that they work on. and. All of our guest artists that were pulled in, I mean, it's just, it was just exceptional. And, uh, you know, I miss it with all of my heart. I really do. Mm. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle misses we, it too. We can go to Leland if you need a moment. Um, okay. You know, for me, um, I, I left uh, November 1st, I left Los Angeles, and, and, um, and I left behind my, a 13-year-old boy and my, my beautiful wife, and, and, and to go and live 9,000 miles uh, away, and 6,000 miles away. So Berlin was extraordinary, and I loved it, and I was so lucky to have the company of, of, of Richard and Mishka and, and, and Richard who? and Tamlin. <laughs> <laughs> who did, who are you? And I love this city. This city's amazing. It's, it's what I hope uh, for, for people seeing the show, what it will do for this generation of TV viewers of, is it, it give a, a different view, a different perspective on Berlin. There's a, there's a stigma. There's, a, there's a, a shadow, a dark, obviously, a very dark a, a part of history attached to Berlin. 
and there's a generation of people there now today that have nothing to do with that and who are uh, vibrant and creative and full of life and and it's a city that should be on uh, the, the grand tour of Europe in the same way that Rome and Paris and London should be. And I hope we, sh we shoot every nook and cranny of Berlin. Uh, and, and it is. It's, it's another star of the show. And I think it'll be something that will be very exciting for people to tune into every week to see where are we going to go next in this city and what can we learn from this city. They've done such an extraordinary job of memorializing the past. And... And, and, and to ensure that the past never happens again, the bad things that have happened in the past. But, you know, we, we, we're, we're in the present now, and, and, and Berlin Station is Berlin in the present. And, and that's really, I think that's really exciting. Okay. Michelle, how about you? Um, well, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so in love with Berlin. I had shot um, a year prior uh, The Hunger Games in, in Berlin. So my, and that was in spring. And, Berlin is a very different city in spring and summer than it is in fall and winter. And um, it's so green and so beautiful and so vibrant and it's such a cafe society. Um, but it's also a little scrappy, you know? I think the, what did they say about Berlin? Poor but sexy? Um, and so that really appeals to me. Um, I've re revealed too much. Uh, <laughs> but, um, it was, when I heard that we would be shooting in winter in Berlin, I, my heart sort of skipped a beat because I, even though I didn't know Berlin in the winter, I could see the grayness, I could see the colors or, or the, the lack of saturation, I could see the bare trees, and I wasn't disappointed when I was there. And the beautiful thing is when, when you're there in the winter and the, the trees drop their leaves, you see these beautiful colors come out in the architecture that I didn't see when I was there in the spring and summer. And uh, the, all those beautiful colors in Prenzlauer Berg, I found out um, before the wall came down, they didn't have any paint. So the first thing they did was they painted these cheerful colors because they'd been living in such grayness for so long. And, and you know, to, to be able to live there, I was there a bit longer, I was there for seven months, um, and to work so closely with these Berliners who share their history with you and are so gracious and warm and welcoming. Um, we were so looked after and um, yeah, I love it. Okay. I love Berlin. That's great. Um, I've personally been a fan of all of yours. So you've, you've all done so many different great roles and projects. So I'm gonna take you back just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, who, who on this panel has appeared on The Golden Girls? <laughs> Leland, tell us about your experience on The Golden Girls. Uh, I played a bellboy. I think it may, it may have been my first job. It was one of my very first jobs. Do they jobs. have a clip? Do you have, do you have the clip? I don't Let's have a clip. Let's run the clip. I wish I had a clip. They were, those women were amazing. They they were amazing and they were pros and and that B Arthur man she she fucking knew comedy like nobody knows comedy she knew I can remember we were in a rehearsal and they asked her to do something and she said it's not gonna fly it's not they're not gonna laugh can you please just do it for us in the dress rehearsal and they they tape a dress rehearsal it's three or four cameras going all at the same time and you you do a dress rehearsal like you're gonna do the show that night in front of a live audience. And uh, goddamn, if we didn't get out there, it came to that moment, and she did the bit they told her to do, and the audience was silent. <laughs> and she turned and she looked right into the camera, you know, right down the barrel of the camera, which went up into the, you know, upper, the control room where all the producers were sitting, and just gave them one of these. And, <laughs> and it was out, you know, by the live taping that, that night. It was gone. It was great. They were great. It was great. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Okay, who on this panel has a musical theater background? <laughs> it ain't me, baby. <laughs> it's me, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Because where, where you, you started more in musical theater than before you were really... Uh, I actually action. started a little bit more... I started classically. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have the knees or the ankles for it, so I ended up lining up and going to open auditions and, and trying to get into musical theaters, which I did. And I did a national tour of 42nd Street, what? not being able to tap dance. 
Um, I also did a tour of Cats uh, and the way and the <laughs> I was a swing in Cats. It's all Roll coming out tonight. Uh -huh. <laughs> this was before iPhones, Leland. It's <laughs> it's not happening. Roll the tape. Um, I <laughs> but I got I had that moment where you you sort of find yourself in that situation. I think I have totally trodden the wrong path here. I'm, I kept being told, smile and look like you're enjoying yourself. And I was like, well, if I was enjoying myself, I'd be smiling. So obviously I'm in, I'm in the wrong place. So I shut it down. And uh, actually my final six months in Cats in the West End paid for me to go to drama school. So um, wow. I'm, now I feel like I might be in the right place. So it was meant to be. <laughs> and never again. <laughs> Who on this panel received a Daytime Emmy nomination? <laughs> and what? I, I, I guilty. And and what were the roles that you played? <laughs> I was a schizophrenic psychiatrist from Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And I was 23, or 22, or something. And what were the character names? Uh, Sunny and Solita. I was Venezuelan. They, they, they forgot to ask me if I spoke Spanish. And, um, and I opened up the first script and there was like this monologue in, in, in Spanish and I had to call them and say, I don't, I don't really speak Spanish. And so every once in a while they just throw in a, a mi corazón. And then that was it. And then I, and then I just sounded like I was from, from, you know, middle America or whatever. But, but now I've but shoulder pads and hair. <laughs> I've always heard actors say that soap operas are like the best training ground for an actor. What do you think? Uh, I would agree with that. I mean, it, it, it definitely taught me that I could be a marathon runner. It, uh, it, it playing two roles uh, that were very emotionally difficult. Of course, you have to skim over, you know, the depth of it and, and, and the intricacies of, of storytelling because you're just doing so much. But uh, I am forever grateful for that experience. I almost had a nervous breakdown because I was working. I don't think I saw the light of day for a winter. I would go to the studio in the dark and come out in the dark. And, but you must um, have been good because you got an Emmy nomination for it. <laughs> well, I was playing crazy, so. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, but it was, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of dialogue. It's a, it, it, and so those muscles start working quite quickly. You know that you can handle a lot, a lot of dialogue. You know that, uh, and it, I was a youngster. I was having to work with three cameras. Like, I didn't know anything about this medium. So, yeah, I was grateful for it. That's amazing. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Berlin Station, October 16th on Epics. <laughs> We've got some drink reception, some food out in the lobby, so please stick around and join us. Thanks for being here. Right.